So John, a couple of years ago, you wrote uh, Serving Without Sinking, How to Serve Christ and Keep Your Joy, which turned into a, a, a surprise bestseller um, all around the world. And, and now you've written, I guess it's kind of like the sequel, your second book, uh, You Can Really Grow. Now, I'm interested in the, in the subject of the book because um, Christian growth is not, not exactly a, a new topic, is it? So why did you decide that there needed to be uh, this book on, on that subject? Mm -hmm. I think it came out of me seeing a, a problem that, that lots of um, men and women in my church and, and other Christian friends I knew weren't growing. They felt like they were stuck in a rut. And I was struggling to tell them what to do. I kind of knew what not to do. Don't make yourself feel like you have to read the Bible 15 minutes a day. Don't feel like you've got to sign up for a course. It's kind of, it's not about an obligation, but I knew there, there is an imperative that, that we need to grow, that this is what the Lord has saved us for, um, that it's, it's delightful. So I wanted to, I guess, for, for my own ministry, sort of, and for my own growth, push into what does it look like day by day to grow as a Christian. So it came out of that, I guess, seeing that a lot of people were just coasting along, um, wanting to grow, not really knowing how to, what it looked like, and, and wanting to work that out so I could be more useful and, and hopefully so the book could serve Christians more widely in their growth. So without giving away the whole contents of the book so that no one actually buys it, um, what, what's, the, what's, what's the central message of You Can Really Grow? Christian growth is growing up as a child of God. So we're saved into God's family and we grow as his children, more like Jesus, his son. So in terms of, you, you mentioned that sort of you, you kind of were thinking about what not to say to people. When it comes to, to this whole idea of Christian growth, growing as a Christian, what, what do you think are the sort of the two, three, four factors that actually stop Christians growing? I think there's some very practical issues. A lot of Christians, they, they, people come to Christ, they're saved, and they, they're, they're eager to know what that looks like, to know more about Jesus, um, and, and they grow. And then often things sort of level off, that the rest of life crowds back in a bit. Um, for some people who've been Christians a long time, as you get a bit older, life often gets more demanding, work, family commitments, church commitments, um, friends, wider family. There's, there's a lot going on. And, and I think a lot of people feel they're just, they're surviving as a Christian. They're, they're going to church. They're sometimes reading their Bible. They're, they're involved. And, and they, they love the Lord. They trust him. But they're, they're kind of on a, a plateau. And I think it just feels like, oh, I, I can't add another thing in. Um, if Christian growth is another thing to do on a, a long list, it's it's just a bit low down for a lot of people. I think often we don't really know what it means. We know the Bible tells us to grow. It talks about growth. We don't really know what that is. And so we can fall into thinking it's growth in skills, um, in my ability to read the Bible and understand it, my ability to pray and organise my prayer life. So it can become quite um, skills-based, technique-based, rather than about character relationship that sort of thing i think i think as well we we don't see ourselves primarily often as as children of god as those who've been saved into relationship so we we tend to not see growth as maturity um and and we might see it as all sorts of other things but but to, to get a, a right understanding of what growth is i think is helpful both because it takes the fear out. If I don't grow up as a child, it doesn't stop me being a child. This is not something that our, our salvation is conditional on, that our relationship with the Lord is conditional on. But of course, children grow. Um, and, and that's a natural part of, of being a child. You grow up in a family. And actually to not grow is, is unnatural and strange. Um, and I guess alongside that, growth is slow. So maybe sometimes because we don't see great results you know we think right this year I'm going to stick to my bible reading plan and by the end of January we've not seen a transformation in our character um, because because growth is is slow you don't look at children and watch them growing you you have to look at the charts on the wall that sort of thing and, and see it over years um, so I think that the one of the things that maybe discourages people is 
that the results are enormous over 10, 20 years. Sometimes there are growth spurts, but often the results over a month or two are, are not so obvious. Mm, that, that's interesting because certainly I find with our, our kids, you can, see, you can see the growth looking back. So we'll suddenly say, oh, wow, Benjamin's really grown over the last month or two. But actually, as you say, sort of I can't, can't sit and watch him growing moment by moment. So, yeah, that's, that's a really helpful way to put it. Certainly it, it struck me um, as, as I was editing it that actually to see growth as growing into somebody more like Jesus and then to see that Jesus is somebody who is the kind of person that I actually really want to be and long to be and actually everybody longs to be, that made growth exciting and something to be aspired to and, and, and desired rather than just something I know I kind of ought to be doing because that's what Christians are meant to do. And, and certainly I think once you set that up, and I think it's the second chapter, isn't it, then, then actually I really wanted to read what you were going to say in the rest of the chapters rather than it being another thing to tick off on my to-do list of being a growing Christian kind of thing. And, and actually in, in some of the later chapters you say some quite surprising things like, Bible reading can be bad for your health and sin is a great way and place to grow as a Christian. Um, and actually in, in your previous book, in Sermon Without Sinking, you said some rather surprising things like where you encourage pastors to think about quitting their jobs. Um, do you deliberately <laughs> set out to say these surprising things or, I mean, what, yeah, you often say surprising things in, in your books. Do you think you just think differently to the norm or, or you want to say surprising things? Why are they in there? I, I do like saying surprising things. Um, I think I think that's how the gospel works. So, so taking the example, Bible reading can be bad for you. Um, Christ says to the Pharisees, you diligently search the scriptures, thinking that by them you'll receive eternal life, yet you refuse to come to me and have life. Um, so their, their Bible reading was exactly the thing that kept them from coming to Christ, um, which is scary and, and needs unpacking because... The Pharisees are mentioned a lot, and I take it that's because the gospel writers, inspired by the Spirit, thought we were in danger of being Pharisees. We who take the Bible seriously are in danger of of putting it in the way of our, our growth in Christ, um, like they did. So, so I think often the, the gospel surprises us. Jesus, he... It's that famous quote from C.S. Lewis, he's not, Aslan is not a tame lion. He's talking about Jesus. Jesus, we can't put him in a box and think we, ah, oh, now I understand the, the almighty creator of all things. Um, it's, it, it's how he, he is. And, and often, you know, I, I kind of think this every week, I stand up in church and preach more or less the same thing because, because the gospel has a, a similarity. But each chapter of the Bible gives us Christ in a, in a different way, a different angle, a different facet. So, so the surprises come because Christianity is, is simple, but with unfathomable depths rather than very complicated in need of lots of clever people to explain it. Um, and I think, I think, yeah, the surprises are there. I do like them. I think, I think though that the Spirit gave us a, a Bible full of surprises so that we we see the same things that are so important in a fresh light every day because otherwise we, we neglect them and, and yet Christ, Christ's love comes to us in, in a thousand different ways, um, surprising and wonderful. And so, yes, I, 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 mean, I do like surprising people, it's fun. Um, but, but I think that's uh, something that flows from the, the very nature of Scripture itself and the nature of, of our God who is always better than, than we think. So I get the sense as we chat that you, you actually quite enjoy writing. Um, what, what got you to writing the, the first book and have you found, how have you found writing the second book different from, from the first? Was it, was it harder? Was it easier? Yeah. Yeah, I, I got into writing. I didn't particularly think of it, but a friend who'd written a few books suggested that I, I ought to think about it. Um, and I, I had the idea for Serve Without Sinking, I saw the need, um, and, and so I wrote a sort of proposal. And then, then in God's grace, he brought you on holiday in Norfolk, and we caught up over supper, and you told me you were working for a good book company, and, and 
it went from there. So, so it's something the Lord very much kind of led me into through through friends and an opening opportunity. Um, in terms of of writing the second book, I I love it. I've I've really enjoyed writing both. Um, neither's felt particularly difficult. I found it quite easy to sit down, write a chapter, um, send it off rewrite it when you send back the edits, that sort of thing. Um, and, and I really enjoy the process. I enjoy having the space to think. I enjoy being made to think clearly and and to tie things down, which you have to, I think, in a book more than when you preach. People can't ask you questions after the sermon to clarify something. You've, you've got to be clear. Um, you've got to, 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 be, to be kind of beyond misunderstanding as much as you can. Um, how was it different? I... The first book, I knew what I wanted to say, and I was writing the book because I felt it was really important, and people were were having real, well, were dying in their faith because of of the way the way they were understanding their service in church. Um, the second book, I saw the problem, but I was less clear on on the answer, and I sort of wrote it because I wanted to work it out. I wanted to help my church more um, in in growth, so and grow myself more. So, so in that sense, it was exciting because it felt more like. Uh, a journey of discovery in some ways but I yeah I really enjoyed both it didn't feel that different the writing of it I guess by the time I got a plan down I knew where I was heading and yeah so fairly similar and um yeah before yeah when I was uh, working for a church and and um not in publishing I had no idea how Christian publishing worked really and and was really surprised when I when I came into it just just to see the the, the process and how many people are, are involved in it and stuff. Uh, I'd be interested to know: uh, was there anything in h- how you got from here's my idea to here's my first book and that now here's my second book? What what has surprised you along along the way, if anything? This is going to sound um, slightly sycophantic. Um, I think the two <laughs> things that have surprised me are the the amount of work an editor does and difference an editor makes I think you know you're the way you've worked and I feel like you've taught me how to write and how to write as myself not how to write in a sort of standard way or something um so I think that that process of working with you has been you know really eye-opening and 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 we'll definitely keep this Um, in the final edit (laughs) definitely (laughs) (laughs) um and 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 yeah partnership in the gospel um the second thing again, I, I genuinely struck me is I, I've always loved the resources Good Book Company has produced. Meeting the team here, I have been so impressed by the, the godliness and desire to, to serve the church that this kind of runs through um, the whole uh, publisher. And, and in that sense, the organisation, in that sense, I, I've I'm just a very big fan of Good Book Company. I, I hope other Christian publishers are the same. I've not got other experience, but I, I, yeah, I've been really impressed, and and yeah, a huge number of people involved, a lot more than I thought, with um, marketing and the distribution and and the kind of the typesetting, the proofreading, all all sorts of things that I guess are obvious, but when you do it, you see the process. But yeah, the way people work together, the prayerfulness of of the team, I think has been has been a really encouraging surprise. Now we uh, we must have sat here about two years ago, I guess, uh, filming the trailer for Sewing Without Sinking, and um, neither of us knew that it was going to sell in the tens of thousands. Um, neither of us knew um, that countless uh, staff teams and and just very ordinary Christians all around the world would be reading it, and 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 actually, you know, that we'd be getting emails from people who who've just been transformed um, and and liberated, and so encouraged and excited. Um, by this little 128-page book, uh, and now here we are, two years later, talking about you can really grow, which um, uh, you know is 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 a different book. Maybe maybe it even has um, relevance for for more people since it's for for every Christian rather than those who are who are serving in in their churches. When we sit here in two years, uh, if the Lord tarries, hopefully talking about your next book, what do you? What do you hope we'll be saying that You Can Really Grow has done for Christians and, and, and for the church? I, I hope that we'll see churches that have, have grown together where there is a, a level of maturity um, across those churches 
and and that that will be reflected in in loving relationships within the church in um lots of people um rolling up their sleeves and serving and and loving it um and and it, particularly in the gospel being shared much more widely i think that our our relative immaturity as christians in in this age um in this country is is a hindrance to the gospel i think we we struggle to have the the passion the the love for our neighbor that comes from from being like christ um and i i'd love it if we we saw churches that were boldly gently um sharing the gospel all the time with their their friends their neighbors their family their colleagues and and loving communities that were were christ-like um so i'd hope that lots of church lots of christians would have read it but i'd love it if lots of churches kind of took it on and read it together said hey why don't we this this term this year let's read this book and and see if we can grow together in christ um I, yeah i would love it if that happened well that would be our prayer john thanks for coming in and thanks for all your work on the on the book and your labors for christ up in up in up in norfolk thank you